Hi there, welcome to the 39th episode of the Synth Project where we are building a synth together. Let's continue the work we started in the previous episode by fixing the sample and all circuit, test everything on the bench, apply the fixes to the actual CV processor module and run a final test directly on the synth rack. If you also have the patience to watch the whole video, I have prepared a little contest for you and the winners will receive a nice gift. Let's begin! Here is the four op amps IC I originally used for the sample and hold circuit, a TL074. This IC is supposed to be produced by Texas Instrument, however you can clearly see that the TI logo on the IC is fake. Instead of seeing the eye of the brand, there is some sort of flame that from a distance seems to be an eye, but really it is not. This one instead is the real IC produced by Texas Instrument. Looking at the logo you can clearly see the T and the I of the manufacturer's name. Even on the bottom side there is a significant difference. Instead of a single central circle with nothing inside, here we have two circles at the two ends of the IC body and one of those is clearly marked with a lot trace called information. This PCB is the same I used to debug the LED voltmeter. I just added the sample and hold circuit components in this area here. And in fact, you can see on the left side the presence of the voltmeter components. I have mounted on the IC socket a device from the same batch of those currently mounted on the CB processor module, which is definitely a counterfeit IC. With this setup, let's try to reproduce the problem to make sure the behavior is the same as the sample and hold circuit in the actual module I previously built and installed on the synth rack. The setup for the test has this little device, which we have seen in the past, used to generate a trigger when the button is momentarily depressed. The device output is connected to the trigger input of the sample and hold circuit. The output of the circuit is instead connected to the input of the voltmeter, so we can have an idea of the value of the voltage generated by the sample and hold once a trigger is generated. This other card provides the interface between the actual power supply and the power supply connector on the PCB. The actual power is provided by this device, which provides the three fixed voltages that we need the plus 12 volts, the minus 12 volts, and the plus 5 volts. Finally, the input of the sample and hold device is connected to the output of this other power supply, emulating a control voltage, which is currently set to provide 0.5 volts DC. Let's now turn on the power supply for the PCB and let's see what happens. Note how even without doing anything yet, the voltmeter started measuring an increasing amount of voltage, which means that the capacitor that is supposed to hold a fixed voltage value is instead actually charging. If I now hit the trigger, the voltmeter quickly shows a value of 0.5 volts, but then the value begins to increase right away. And this confirms that the circuit, as is, is not working as it was designed. Let's now replace the counterfeit IC with the original one from Texas Instrument. First, let's turn off the power supply. Now we need to remove the fake chip. And now we put the original IC on the socket. Now we can turn on again the power supply. We hit the trigger button and we can see that immediately the voltmeter shows the same 0.5 volt we put at the input of the sample and hold circuit. And now, note how the voltage is stable. There is no more increase in voltage. And actually, we should see the voltage going down a little bit at a time due to the parasitic resistance of the holding capacitor, which will discharge it slowly over time. 
However, such parasitic resistance is very high and therefore it should take a while before we can actually see its effect. And in fact, you can see that the LED column is pretty darn stable, which means the voltage is not changing, or it is changing so slowly that we cannot see the effect yet. Just for the sake of it, let's wait for a while until the voltage starts dropping. And it took a whole minute and 15 seconds before we could see a decrease in voltage. And so, now we have 0.4 volts and at the same point and old output which means that in over a minute the capacitor only lost enough charge to lose 0.1 volts. So basically we have proved that the counterfeit IC was the culprit for the wrong behavior of the sample and hold circuit. At this point we can take the control voltage processor module and apply to it both the fixes, the one for the voltmeter and the one for the sample and hold circuit. Here is the control voltage processor module, which I already removed from the synth rack. I have also already detached the top PCB and the divider, so I can access the back of the first PCB to make the fix to the voltmeter, like I did in the extra PCB I mounted, and I can also access both the top sides of the PCBs to replace the counterfeit ICs. Before applying the changes, however, let's replicate the problems one more time. Ok, the power supply is now connected to the module with the same interface I used a few minutes ago for the test PCB. Let's now test the voltmeter and see how it behaves. To access the voltmeter input I'll use this jack to which I will attach the cables coming from the second power supply which is still providing 0.5 volts. This way we can replicate the same procedure done with the test PCB. So, let's turn on the test power supply. Let's set the voltmeter range to 1 volt, which is the range that was causing problems. And finally, let's power up the module itself. We can already see that there are several illuminated LEDs, whereas there should be only 5. And if I disconnect the input, we can clearly see the high frequency internal noise causing the LEDs to light up in this strange way. So let's install the extra capacitor now in the circuit and let's see if that fixes the problem also in this case. Looking at the test PCB, the capacitor needs to be mounted right here, which is basically the second pin in this column and also the second in this other column. I am going to mark the two pins with a black marker, so I will not mistakenly solder the capacitor in the wrong place. Here, like this. Let me zoom in so you will have a better view of what is going on. Here is the 100 picofarad capacitor. I am going to thin its terminals so it will be easier to solder it in place. Just a little bit of solder on both wires so that the flux will remove any oxide and will allow for a clean joint on the PCB. Let's now put the capacitor on the PCB. First the left wire. And now we position the other wire and solder it on the PCB pad. And now that the capacitor is attached to the PCB, Let's add a little more solder to allow some extra flux to keep the joint clean from oxides. Now we just need to fold the capacitor over the PCB, paying attention to its pins so they won't touch any other part of the PCB itself. Bending a little bit the wires will help in avoiding unwanted contacts with other pads of the PCB. And now that the fix is done, let's repeat the test to see if the problem is gone. So, we are now back with the previous test configuration. Let's power up the module, disconnecting the input, and now there are no illuminated LEDs, sign that there is no more high frequency noise that affects the functionality of the voltmeter. Let me now reconnect the input to the second power supply, and let's turn it on. 
This power supply is still providing 0.5 volt and as expected, now only 5 LEDs are on. Let's now try some more voltage values to see if we get precise measurements. Let's go down to 0.3 volts. And yes, only 3 LEDs are on, good. Let's go down a little bit more to 0.2 volts. And we have 2 illuminated LEDs. Finally, if I disconnect the input jack, all the LEDs go off, as they should. So the fix is successful and we can now move to fixing the two sample and hold circuits. To test the sample and hold circuit, I am going to connect the output of the circuit to the input of the voltmeter, so we can see if there is any change in the output voltage after generating a trigger. To generate the trigger manually, I am going to use again the same device I used previously with the test PCB, and I am going to use another jack connector to inject the trigger signal into the sample and hold circuit. Let's connect the jack cable with the push button device. This one is the wire carrying the signal. This one is the ground. And the positive wire goes to the plus 12 volts power supply. Finally, we connect the input of the sample and hold to the power supply that provides a low voltage, which I am going to set to 0.5 volt. Right now, the sample and hold switch is off, and so we see the correct 5 lighted LEDs on the voltmeter. But, as you can see, as soon as I switch the sample and hold on, more and more LEDs light up, quite fast. And that means that the holding capacitor is being charged by the counterfeit IC, which is instead supposed to behave like a very high impedance. If we press the trigger, the LED's number go back to the right amount, but then the others start turning on again, one by one. So, let's now replace the counterfeit IC with the original one, and let's see the effect of the sample and hold circuit. This is the counterfeit IC in question. I am going now to remove it with the help of my pointy tweezers. I am going to throw this away along with all the others that I bought in the same batch. Here instead is the new TL074 I bought. This is not a counterfeit device. Look at the logo where the T and the I initials are perfectly visible. This IC comes from a reputable vendor that gets the components directly from the manufacturer. Let's put it now on the socket. And now we can test again the sample and hold circuit. Here is the same setup we just used for testing the bed IC. Turning now on the power supply for the module. Turning on the power supply that provides the input voltage to the sample and hold circuit. And right now all the LEDs are off. Now I am going to push the button that generates the trigger. And the first LEDs are now on, and they are stable. There are no more LEDs turning on at a fast pace. So the sample and hold circuit is now working correctly. And at this point I just need to replace the same IC to the other PCB of the module, and then I can reinstall the module in the synth rack. First thing, we need to reassemble the divider and the hanging PCB. The divider goes in first, holding place by four spacers. Then the PCB, which is holding place by four screws, inserted into the underneath spacers. A couple of more screws, and the module is ready to be mounted in the rack. But before that, let's just do a final check to make sure that all the cables are still in place in the receptacles. To mount the module in the rack, we need first to reconnect the power supply cables, one for each PCB. Now we can position the module and reattach it with some screws. These are the times when I appreciate the usefulness of a modular construction, Besides the fact that we can create one module at a time and grow the whole synth a little bit at a time, 
Having separate modules helps with repairs, since we can remove just the malfunctioning module and replace it after it has been fixed, or in case it is not possible, we can replace it with a new one. And the other useful thing is that we can also rearrange the relative position of each module if we find that it is more convenient to keep certain modules in one position rather than another. Ok, now the module is in place and we can run some practical tests on it to verify that it is really working fine from the sound generation standpoint. So, let's run a few tests to make sure the fixes are still working with the module in its slot on the rack. We are particularly interested in the voltmeter and in the sample and hold circuits. Let's connect with this cable the output of the sample and hold circuit to the input of the voltmeter. Then I will connect the output of the keyboard into the input of the sample and hold circuit. And of course, I will need to connect the trigger from the keyboard to the trigger input of the sample and hold. Turning on the synth, and here it looks like the voltmeter is providing a constant read every time a key is pressed. Let's now bring the control voltage to the VCO. And look, the sound is stable, the pitch does not increase nor decrease every time I set a new note through the keyboard. Let's try now something a little more complicated. Instead of having a constant volume of the VCO signal, I'm going to use the ADSR to control it. And of course I will need to add a trigger to the ADSR module, which I can get from the trigger through on the sample and hold. Lastly, I need to add a gate signal to the ADSR, and I will take that directly from the keyboard module. And now let's play some sound adjusting the controls of the ADSR module. This is the effect provided by the release control. And now let's play a little bit with all the ADSR controls. Let's now add one more module to the mix. This time, instead of putting the output of the sample and hold directly into the VCO, I'll make it go through the glider. Everything seems to work fine. However, I'm kind of tired to hear the sound of the switches of the keyboard while I play. I think it is time to provide a MIDI interface through the synth, so we can control it from a much nicer MIDI keyboard. Thank you for having followed me through all these episodes on the design, construction, repair and final installation of the control voltage processor module. It took much more time than I expected, but the results seem very good now that everything works as it should. So thank you for all the time spent with me in this Odyssey, I will leave you with a little impromptu performance with the synth and with the help of some other device I have around to provide some fullness to the rendition. Please listen to the music I will play and try to guess what it is. You have to guess the title and the performers I am trying to emulate. The first two listeners that make the right guess will be awarded with one of the synth PCB of their choice. 
I will ask the winners what they would like to receive and I will send it to them. My gift for the holidays. Remember also to subscribe to the channel and enable the notifications if you haven't done so already, so you will avoid missing any future episode and you will also help grow this channel. Happy experiments and happy listening!